Friends and family, please stand for the reading of God's word. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Revelation 21, three through seven. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. The gospel is good news. The gospel has saved our souls. The gospel brings us new life. We have been given a love that is greater than life itself. And yet we often bury this love in the depths of our souls and refuse to bring it to our lips. We feel timid, awkward even, to share this good news. But why? Whether we are walking down the halls of our own home or the streets of Los Angeles or the roads of the 1040 window, we see image bearers of God. And yet many of these image bearers do not know their savior. They do not know this good news that has saved our souls. And how are they to believe if they have not heard? Friends, Jesus has commanded us to proclaim the good news to all of creation in word and in deed. We are not driven by guiltiness, shame, or human inspiration, but rather we are compelled to share this good news out of the great love that we have been given. We stand in the almighty power and authority of Jesus Christ, who has forgiven our sins and brought us freedom. And this act beckons us to say, here I am, Lord, send me. We do this in light of eternity, for we have been given a promise that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away and he will be our God and we will be his people. Friends, may this good news not be shut up in our bones. May we proclaim the gospel in word and in deed. The theme for Viola's 87th annual missions conference is proclaim. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather as the body of Christ in your name and to hear what it is you have for us this week. Lord, I pray against any hearts that are feeling apathetic towards the power of your gospel, that that would be melted away by your sweet love, that you have saved us and set us free from the law of sin and death that you have given us new life and eternity spent with you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with our friends and family about what it is that you have for us, Lord. And may the words of our lips and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So on behalf of SMU and our Missions Conference family, we want to thank you for being here this morning. Uh, As Kaylin said, this has been a year in the making. Uh, Almost a year ago to the day, Molly and I sat down for the first time and we began praying and dreaming about uh, what this conference would look like, the theme and the desire that God had placed on us uh, to align our hearts and the hearts of students at Biola with the Great Commission. And so we are honored to work with 88 passionate, incredible, hardworking students to put on this missions conference. And uh, we, we wanna thank you for, uh, for being here with us this morning. 
Romans 10, 13 through 15 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they haven't even heard? And friends, how can, how can they hear unless someone proclaims it to them? And how can anyone proclaim unless they are sent? I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and hockey was my entire life. Uh, I idolized Wayne Gretzky, number 99. He was the greatest hockey player to ever live. And I started playing at the age of four. Uh, I actually played with the same group of guys all the way till I was 18 and graduated from high school. And my freshman year of high school, uh, my coach texted me and asked me if I could make it to a last minute scrimmage that he was putting together on a Sunday night. And I never missed a practice, I never missed a game, but I had a lot of homework that night, so I texted him back and said, Coach, I'm kind of busy, is it okay if I miss just this once? And he said, yeah, that's, that's fine. So I did my homework and uh, got on Facebook a couple of hours later, and the first thing that popped up on my news feed was my team playing hockey with Wayne Gretzky. My hero, the greatest hockey player who had ever lived. He was in my town for the Kentucky Derby and he just wanted to play a little scrimmage and so there was my team and I was not there. And all I could think was, coach, you knew that I could have met my hero and you didn't even tell me. Like, how much do you have to hate me to know that I could have met my hero and not tell me? And yet I know the savior of the world and I keep it to myself. Friends, outside right now, uh, over the Jesus mural is a banner that is hanging. And it says, what if you had never heard? And that is the reality for 27% of the world today. They have never heard the gospel. 42% of the world remains unengaged, which means less than 2% of their people group knows the gospel. And this is the reality. They're not just missing out on knowing Wayne Gretzky, but they're missing out on the reality of knowing our Savior and the one who has made them in his own image. And as Charles Spurgeon puts it, if Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent because your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. For every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. So as Jake mentioned in this beautiful quote by Spurgeon, our eyes will flash as we talk of his sweet love. But friends, I am afraid that we have all stopped talking. We've stopped opening our mouths to share the sweet love of the gospel. We will go halfway across the world, and this is me included, we will go halfway across the world to bring our hungry brothers and sisters in Christ bread without any mention of the bread of life. And what happens is they are left hungry again, or I get the glory because I haven't mentioned the one who has sent me in the first place. And I don't want you guys to misunderstand me when I say this, for we are called to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and rescue the slaves. But we do this in the name of Jesus, striving to proclaim his name as we do it. We cannot have a silent tongue about him. And there's something that Jake and I have begun to learn as we unpack and discover the beauty of this theme, is that if we do not believe in the power of the gospel ourselves, we are going to have a hard time proclaiming it to others. If we do not believe that Jesus has died so that we might live, that he has taken our place on the cross, that all of the wrath that we deserved for our sins has been imparted onto him so that we may be standing before our God, our creator and sustainer, and we are clean and we are made new. If we do not believe that, friends, we are going to have such a hard time telling it to other people. Our eyes will flash as we talk of his sweet love. We are talking about someone that we love, someone who has died so that we could live. Isaiah chapter six begins with bad news. King Uzziah has died. In the days that follow, Isaiah has a vision where he sees the Lord high and exalted and seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And at this incredible, beautiful sight, what is Isaiah's response? Woe is me, he cries, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Friends, this response is similar to that of Moses when God called him. Lord, I, I murdered a man. I ran away. I have a speech impediment. How and why would you want to use me to proclaim freedom? Jeremiah, Lord, I, I, I'm too young. How can you use me? Peter, standing before the Lord saying, how can you use me, Lord? I denied you again and again and again. And friends, <laughs> I know that many times I am standing in that same place. I have my list of reasons of why God can't use me. I got a B in my theology class. I hear my friends pray and they use these eloquent words. God, I don't know how to, how to speak like that. Lord, you know me and I know you. I have seen holy, holy, holy. God, you are the Lord and I am not. And how could you use me? You know my sin. You know my shame more than anyone else. Why would you ever want to use me? And if that was the end of the story, <laughs> Woe is me would be the right response, mm. but it's not. For one of the seraphim flew to Isaiah with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched Isaiah's mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Viola, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You have been freed. Your minds have been freed. Your hearts have been freed. Your hands have been freed. Your eyes have been freed. Your ears have been freed. And your mouths have been freed. You get to talk about someone that you love. This isn't a, a ah, I don't talk about Jesus enough, so I need to go preach a little bit more. No, no, no. This is saying, I love my Savior. And so I can't keep him to myself. Friends, freedom changes everything. We see this freedom so beautifully displayed in John 4 and the woman at the well as she shamefully walks in the heat of the day by herself, ashamed, isolated from her community because of her sin and forced to walk during the hardest, hottest part of the day. And she meets Jesus at this well and he proclaims eternal life to her. He says, for whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up into eternal life. Friends, he gives her eternal life. He sets her free from the bondage of sin and death, and she is a good steward of that freedom. You know what she does? She runs back into her community in Samaria, and she proclaims the good news that has just saved her soul. She is no longer living in this shame. She is no longer living in this guilt that has paralyzed her from talking about Jesus. She goes and proclaims the good news that has saved her soul. She can't help but talk of the sweet love. Jesus gives her hope, the hope and expectation that only can be satisfied through the promise of eternal life. And this is where we get to the why of proclaim, the why of this theme for Missions Conference. For Revelation 21 gives us a promise too beautiful to be true that we are to live in constant awareness, that we are citizens of another age, that we are just passing through this place. So what does it look like here? What has he commanded us to do here? And that is to proclaim the gospel to all of creation because we have been given a hope and we cannot keep that hope to ourselves. We have been given a hope and an expectation that we get to spend eternity with our Savior. And we want everyone to be a part of that. We want everyone to get, have the hope that we have. And with that mindset, our natural response will be to invite people into that promise, to share that hope. And like Jake mentioned earlier, how much do you have to hate someone to not tell them about this hope? Revelation 21 gives us a promise that there will be no more mourning. 
No more crying. No more pain. No more fear. No more cancer. No more depression. No more anxiety. No more car wrecks. No more bullying. No more jealousy. No more eating disorders. No more racism. No more divorce. No more orphans. No more perfectionism. No more starvation. No more rape. No more abuse. No more pornography. No more widows. No more genocide. No more ISIS. No more war. No more violence. No more persecution. No more guilt. No more shame. No, no more, more death. death. Friends, this is the gospel that we proclaim, that Jesus has come to bring life and life to the full here on earth. He has come to bring us joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding. He has come to bring us freedom, to atone for our sin, to, to, to make us clean that we may stand before him and say, Lord, I am here, send me. And we can go to all creation, to our families, to our neighbors, to the people of La Mirada in Los Angeles, to the people of the United States of America, to the nations of the earth, to the 1040 window, and proclaim that there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, and no more death, and eternal life will be found in Jesus Christ. Friends, this is the gospel that we proclaim. Please pray with us. <laughs> Father, you are good, <laughs> and you have given us the honor of being your children. Yeah. And as your children, Lord, we just want to talk about our Father. We want to talk about the good news that has saved us. We want to show the good news that has saved us through our actions. We want to serve others to show them the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has come to bring life now and forevermore. So Father, I pray that uh, throughout this week, through Missions Conference, Lord, that you would bring freedom to Biola. That you would continue to, to remind us, Lord, that you have wiped away our sin and our shame, and you have redeemed our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears and our mouths, that we may proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ through word and indeed, Father, be with us. This conference is yours. Amen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.